And we are back for episode 3.8. Our episode begins with Arya contemplating a rock after being kidnapped by the Hound. As in the book, Arya tries to smash in the Hound's head and fails, though in the book he physically wrestles the rock from her rather than just threatening her. They get on the road and the conversation between Arya and the Hound matches the book relatively closely in subject matter. The Hound and Arya speak of the mountain and Sansa and where they are heading. Interestingly, the show has kept the line, you didn't know my brother. Of course, Arya did know the mountain, so well in fact that the mountain and his men are the bulk of her death list. And in the book, Arya certainly tells the Hound this. The brotherly hatred talk is what transitions to the sisterly hatred talk and why Sansa is brought up. So in both book and show, Arya is confused as to where they are. She believes that the trident is the Blackwater Rush. Now there is a reason why Arya is all turned around. The rains that were briefly mentioned last episode by the Tullys are actually pretty widespread in the book. They have flooded all of the rivers, so Arya can't identify them anymore by size. Arya and the Hound even have a little adventure where they take a rather dangerous ferry ride across the flooded trident. The Hound ends up stiffing the boat captain and gives him an IOU that the Brotherhood Without Banners gave him for the 9,000 gold dragons they stole. Not that the ferryman would ever actually likely collect on this. In the book, there's actually quite a lot on paper currency, debts, and promises replacing actual gold in our story ranging from Littlefinger to the Iron Bank to Tyrion promising wealth to the Second Sons. I imagine our author is making some sort of statement about capitalism replacing feudalism, or perhaps criticizing capitalism itself and the lifting of the gold standard. Of course, George R. R. Martin is no economist, and it's all a bit convoluted. But it's a bit fun to think about how much that money has been borrowed. Remember, Robert and Littlefinger had to borrow money in order to pay the Hound at the tournament. And then the Brotherhood Without Banners borrows the borrowed money. And then the Hound pays for services with the promise of returned borrowed money. Anyway, there is one more thing missing from the show journey, and that's the fact that Arya was briefly marking trees to let the Brotherhood Without Banners know where she's going. And the actions do seem somewhat effective. The Brotherhood Without Banners, as well as Rorg and Biter, do end up on Arya's trail. Meanwhile, over in Silver's Bay, Danny is checking out the size of the Yunkish army, as well as their sellsword contingents. Now the show has played around with the numbers, but the most important thing is that the cell swords are mounted while Danny only has infantry. Some of the knowledge she gets with her brief time with Barristan, but the book reveals that Viserys, for some odd reason, used to talk to Danny extensively about battlefield tactics. As with the dragons and the High Valerian language, it's another area in which Viserys' knowledge ends up saving Danny. Now in both book and show, Danny treats with the cell swords. Now the show has merged the two sellsword companies of the Stormcrows and the Second Sons. In the show, there's just the Second Sons, although the Stormcrows are name-dropped as a sellsword company that Stannis uses in the North later on. So in the book, it's the Stormcrows that have three captains, a Yunkish man named Prendel, a Carthine named Salor, and Dario Naharis. The Second Sons are separately headed by Miro. In the show's merger, we have Prendel, Miro, and Dario. This merger actually removes a very important literary parallel. You see, in the book, Danny gives Miro and the Second Sons a wagon of alcohol and tells him they will treat the next day. And Miro is actually pretty open to the idea of switching to Danny's side, telling her, you are worth fighting for. However, Danny then attacks the drunken Second Sons in the middle of the night and captures most of them. A clever plan, perhaps, but it's also the exact same tactic as the Red Wedding. Danny, just like Walder Frey, violates an assumed period of peace with a potential ally and then attacks them while they're drunk. Dario and the Stormcrows are a slightly different story. Prendel is Yunkish and likely had family slaughtered at Astapor. There is no way he is switching sides. Danny planned on attacking the Stormcrows in a surprise attack as well, but Dario's betrayal changes everything. And then there's Dario. Oof, there is so much on Dario. Dario in the book is presented as a man who has blue hair, a yellow mustache, painted fingernails, and dresses in very fine yellow clothing. When Danny first meets Dario with the other Stormcrows, he says nothing. Only when Dario returns with the heads of his other captains is he suddenly verbose, and Danny notices that his clothes are dirty and frayed, his painted nails are chipped, and he has salt stains on his boots. Nothing about Dario switching sides makes much sense. He kills the other captains, presents them to Danny, and then says he can go back and claim he was scouting. But why would his men tolerate the murder of his other captains? And why would Dario choose to go out in the middle of the night wearing bright yellow? And why would the captain of the company be scouting alone? And if he could simply kill the other captains to maintain control of the company, why did he sneak out in the first place? It's all so, so perplexing. 
Nearly everything Dario says and does in the book is rather enigmatic, and this is why there's so much speculation among book fans on who Dario really is and what his motives really are. Show Dario, though, is essentially just a guy who is really smitten with Danny. In our next scene, Melisandre has brought Gendry to Dragonstone. Now, the show has merged into Gendry another of Robert's bastards, one named Edric Storm. Edric is one of Robert's bastards by Delina Florent, Stannis' wife Selyse's cousin. So like Shireen, Edric is a Baratheon Florent, and I do wonder if Stannis looks at Edric and is reminded of the fact that he lacks a son. The Edric Storm plot in the book is one that takes up quite a bit of time, is rather perplexing, and hasn't led anywhere yet. It kind of begins right after Renly dies in A Clash of Kings. Storm's End won't yield to Stannis solely because the Castellan fears for the safety of Edric. Stannis does eventually get both the castle and the boy, and then Melisandre and Selyse's uncle, Axel Florent, start pushing for his sacrifice in order to wake stone dragons. Now those crazy religious antics aren't too surprising, but there are a few things that are just puzzling about the whole situation. For example, in the book Melisandre pushes hard to kill the boy, but she also weirdly claims that she planned for Davos to meet the boy, and Davos does nothing but try to save Edric, and weirdly Melisandre speaks for sparing Davos after he tried to kill her. So Melisandre essentially does a couple actions that foil her own plan for killing Edric Storm. Over the same period of time, Salador San is also acting very odd. Salador is almost certainly informing for Melisandre and does scheme with Axel Florent, but then he betrays both of them and helps Davos spirit Edric Storm away. It's really hard to say what exactly is going on. My best guess is that Melisandre wanted Davos to try to spring Edric Storm and in doing so commit treason again. And that way, her crony Axel Florent would become Hand. In fact, Davos specifically says that he expects Axel Florent to become Hand after he spirits Edric Storm away. Interestingly, Melisandre is quite shocked that Edric gets away, despite the fact that Davos was speaking strongly against killing him for half of a Storm of Swords. It may be that Mel thought there was no chance Davos would succeed because she thought she had Salador San as her man but in the end she was betrayed by Salador. Regardless, Edric Storm is now hiding in lice with an Andrew Estermont and likely Salador Sand's men. Anyway, in both book and show, Stannis is on the fence about killing Edric. Though book Stannis is a bit more of a liar, or at least self-delusional. In the book, Stannis repeatedly says he would never hurt Edric Storm, and then immediately gets into debates about whether they should burn him. Meanwhile, over in Slaver's Bay, we have this extra scene where the Second Sons try to decide who will execute Daenerys. Of course, Daenerys is the only perspective in Slaver's Bay in the book at this point, so we have no idea what discussions the Second Sons or Storm Crows ever had. Next, we have a scene between Tyrion and Sansa, where Tyrion is apologizing for his betrothal to her. Here, Tyrion claims that Sansa is no longer a prisoner and he won't hurt her, but in the book, Tyrion essentially just tells her, well, at least I'm not Joffrey. Tyrion isn't very charming in the book, and the two certainly don't share a moment like they do in the show. The show has certainly extended out the marriage of Tyrion and Sansa quite a bit. In the book, Sansa finds out about her betrothal, is married, has a wedding feast, and has her wedding night, all in one chapter. Here we get an extra scene between Cersei and Marjorie, where Marjorie wants to be friends with Cersei, and Cersei gets angry and tells her the story about how House Lannister extinguished House Rain. In the book, Cersei and Marjorie never share openly hostile words until right before the two women's arrests. And then Sansa gets married. As in the book, Joffrey gives her away. The story has a number of these odd marital handoffs, whether it be Theon and Jane Poole or John and Elise Karstark. I imagine George R. R. Martin is stressing the lack of agency these people have in their marriage decisions, and how generally off the practice of giving someone away is. Even today, we have the practice of giving someone away as tradition, but it's actually a pretty brutal reminder of how bad the world used to be, and how bad it still is in many places. So here in the show, Joffrey acts as a troublemaker and removes Tyrion's stool, so Sansa has to kneel down for Tyrion. In the book, it's actually Sansa who is the troublemaker and refuses to kneel. And so Joffrey orders the fool Dantos to act as Tyrion's footstool. It's actually a pretty ridiculous scene. Tyrion is married while standing on top of Ser Dantos' back. Next, we get this extra scene between Melisandre and Gendry, where she shows off some boobs and extracts some blood. In the book, Edric Storm is much younger, and they simply leech him because he's supposedly sick. He probably wasn't sick at all. It's actually another moment where Stannis lies to Davos immediately after saying he would never hurt the boy. Anyway, in both book and show, Stannis and Mel burn some leeches while Davos looks on. Our next scene is Tyrion and Sansa's wedding feast, which is filled with all sorts of extra scenes. The Queen of Thorns talking about how Loras is now Marjorie's father-in-law, Tywin getting angry at Tyrion for getting whiskey dick, 
Cersei trying to get Joffrey to lay off Sansa, Loras trying to talk to Cersei. About the only scene that happens in the book is Joffrey threatening to rape Sansa and then demanding the bedding ceremony. In both book and show, this leads to Tyrion threatening to geld Joffrey and Tyrion barely escaping the situation by passing it off as a jape. Next comes the betting scene, which follows fairly closely to the book, with Tyrion saying he won't bang Sansa unless she wants it, and Sansa asking, what if I never want to? In the book, Tyrion replies, that's why the gods made whores and leaves the bed, and in the show, Tyrion says, and so my watch begins, and passes out drunk. Next, we get an extra scene where Danny is taking a bath with Missandei and talking about languages. Here in the show, Dario improbably sneaks past all of the guards, shows off the heads of the other captains, and then gets to stare at Daenerys naked before pledging his fealty to Daenerys. In the book, Dario is actually caught sneaking in before showing off the heads and pledging his fealty. Essentially, book Dario is not a ninja. Next, we get an extra scene where Shay noisily comes in to show her jealousy and is pleased not to find Hymen blood. Now, the show has quite a few of these angry, jealous Shay scenes that just aren't in the book. Book Shay actually almost acts in an opposite manner. She says weird things like, I like being your whore, which perhaps makes Tyrion feel even guiltier. And finally, Sam and Gilly have made it to an abandoned wildling village. Now, many wildling villages seem to be centered around a werewood, and this one is no different. And of course, the presence of a werewood makes one wonder if Bloodraven and the Children of the Forest are watching. In the book, while Sam sleeps in this village, he has strange dreams of a good life at Horn Hill with Gilly. So it could be that Bloodraven is trying to get Sam to fall in love with her. Now here in the show we have an extra scene of Sam and Gilly talking about baby names. In the book, wildling babies are not named until they're two, so mothers won't get attached to them in case they die young. Now here in the show, Ravens warn Sam of a White Walker attack, and Sam kills it with a piece of dragon glass. In the book, Sam had already killed an other earlier when fleeing the Fist of the First Men. Now instead in the book, Sam is attacked by whites at the Wildling Village. But not just any whites. He battles Small Paul, a huge black brother. The same black brother that actually saved Sam's life by carrying him from the Fist of the First Men. After burning Small Paul, Sam runs into a number of other brothers who were lost at the Fist. Ravens end up attacking these whites, allowing Sam and Gilly to escape, and they are picked up by Blood Raven's servant, Cold Hands. Now it's a bit of a mystery who exactly was controlling those whites. It may be that the others were after that baby, but then again, it also may be that Blood Raven was staging an attack and wanted Sam to trust Cold Hands and pass that trust off to Bran. Additionally, Blood Raven needed Sam in order to get Bran through the wall. It's definitely hard to say. And that's all for episode 3.8. See you in episode 3.9.